Well, now, in this new passage, we have a number of new words which we must learn. And one of the first words is justification. It's a long Latin word, really. It means it's straight from the law courts. And it's used by the judge in the court when a man is found innocent and a case is dismissed against him. I think we'll just wait till everybody's in. So it's equivalent to being declared innocent. Now, how can it be that God could ever declare those who have sinned in the way that we saw in the earlier chapters? How could it be that God could declare them innocent? It sounds an impossibility. But this is God's solution to the problem. And it is to justify not what they've done, but to justify them themselves and to say they're innocent. But how can they be when they're guilty? And the next few verses, verses 21 to 31 of chapter 3, sort that out for us and tell us how God can remain just and be the justifier of sinners. How can he do it? God is so righteous that he must punish sin. Or to put it another way, God is too righteous to forgive anyone. It would be immoral for a just God to dismiss someone as innocent when he knows perfectly well they're not innocent. So how come? And the answer is really very simple. God can only forgive sin when it's been paid for, when justice has been done. And that can only happen when an innocent person is punished instead of the guilty. And then his justice has been satisfied and the sinner has been justified, declared innocent. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're at the heart of the gospel now. And the heart of the gospel is quite simply if there was one person who never should have been punished for sin, it's the one sinless person, Jesus, who was punished. Now that, in the simplest way I can put it, has enabled God to change his attitude to sin from one of forbearance to one of forgiveness. And the key words that begin the section I'm talking about are, but now, but now. Whenever you find one of God's but in scripture, it's terribly important. Something has happened which changes the whole situation. Up till now, God has not forgiven sin. He couldn't offer forgiveness until now. He has taken a forbearing attitude. He has been overlooking sin. Quite literally, in one point in Acts 17, Paul tells the people on Athens that God has been winking at sin until but now. So there's a huge difference between forbearing sin and forgiving it. And God could not fully forgive sin until it had been paid for. And paid for by an innocent person voluntarily accepting the punishment that was due to the guilty. Now that's the most amazing thing. That's the heart of the gospel. And so as this section finishes by saying, so that God can be just and the justifier of the guilty. 
but there's a condition also. On God's part, justice has to be satisfied. The punishment of sin has to take place. And the cross is not so much a demonstration of God's love as a demonstration of his justice. That's what it says here. And it's only when you realize that the cross is a clear demonstration of his justice that someone has to be punished to satisfy his justice, but that in his grace, and that's another new word that comes in this paragraph, in his sheer grace, his undeserved favor, he has sent his son to bear the punishment on our behalf. Now, until you grasp that, you will never understand the cross. To put it as simply as I can, because Jesus took my punishment that was due to me, I can be forgiven my past. Justice has been satisfied. But that requires a condition on my part as well. It can't happen automatically. It requires on my part faith in Jesus. And that's another key word in this passage. Faith occurs eight times in these few verses. That's the key. On God's part, his justice has been satisfied by his son, no less, who lived a perfect life, who did not deserve to die. But on my part, I must put my faith in that person who died for me. Now this word faith, again, what does it mean? It doesn't mean just agreeing to what I've just been saying. Faith in someone is much more than faith that someone. Real faith that saves, that justified, is not saying, I believe that Christ was punished for my sin. That is believing that. It's not yet believing in him. I was preaching in Hanover in Germany, and I was preaching on faith, and I asked the congregation this question, how many of you believe that I exist? And everybody put their hands up. I said, that's a believing that someone exists or someone has done something for me. But then I said, how many of you believe in me? And only half a dozen people put their hands up. They'd begun to see the difference believing that I am who I am and have done what I've done. But believing in me is something different. And so there was a lot of hesitation now, but eight, six or eight people put their hands up, including a well-dressed lady in the front row, and I can see her now. And I said, now those of you who professed faith in me, I don't know if you have that faith or not. You said you have faith in me, but you have given me nothing to prove that or to demonstrate that you really do believe in me. And I said to this lady in the front row, she looked as if she would take a little teasing. I said, now you raised your hand and you said you believe in me. I won't be able to know that that's true until you do something to show me that you trust me. I said, if you gave me your money to look after, I would know that you believed in me. And a horrible hush came over the entire congregation. I was actually addressing the richest lady in Hanover. <laughs> and the whole church was horrified that I said, give me your money to look after and I'll know you believe in me. <laughs> but I meant it. I later found that she'd paid for the church to be built in which I was speaking, a lovely brand new church. But I'd made the point. 
Faith is showing someone by your act that you believe in them. And you're doing that every day. If I get into a car that you are driving, I am believing in you. It's a matter of trust and obedience together. Faith combines both. If you believe in someone, you will do what they tell you. And if they say, get into my car, you'll get into their car, if you believe in them. Every time I get into a plane, I'm putting my trust in the pilot. I'm believing that he'll get me there. And getting on the plane is an act of faith. Now with faith in Jesus, you need to do something to show him that you trust him and that therefore you will obey him if he tells you to do something. That's faith in someone. And we're going to see in this study that Abraham is the classic example of someone who really put his trust in the Lord. He didn't know Jesus at that time. Jesus hadn't been born, but, but he had faith in God. And you know when he demonstrated that faith. And that was when God not only gave him a son, but told him to sacrifice that son. Now that was a terrific test of Abraham. And yet he went on with the sacrifice of Isaac. And a most significant statement was made afterwards. Now God didn't let him sacrifice Isaac, but he tested him to the point of cutting his only hope of the future right off because only through Isaac would the promise be fulfilled. And God said, now kill him for me. And I can imagine them going up that hill when the boy said, you've got the wood for the sacrifice, but you've got no animal to sacrifice. How are you going to offer a sacrifice to God? I don't know if Abraham told him at that point, but sooner or later, he must have realized that he was the sacrifice. And Abraham was willing to go right through with his death. And it says after that, now listen very carefully, after that, God said to Abraham, now I know that you fear me. And in those three little words, there is a most amazing revelation of God's ignorance of the future. God could know everything that Abraham could do, but he was not sure yet of what he would do in the circumstances. Now that's a unique revelation of God's relationship to us. God doesn't know everything about your future in the sense that he does not know which decision you will make. He knows the consequences of those decisions, whether you say yes or no to him. He knows what can happen to you, but he does not know what will happen. Now that may come as a shock to you. The idea is so common that God knows everything that's going to happen and knows for sure which way you're going to decide before you decide. And yet here we have this phrase from God, now I know. Now God is sure of Abraham's faith. He was not sure before that. But when Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, that was an assurance to God of Abraham's faith, which God was not sure of up to that point. Now I know. Underline those words in your Bible. They are so important. They tell you something about our God in relation to our freedom. We are free to choose. God hasn't predetermined our choice. Don't ever interpret predestination as predetermination. 
We'll come back to that later in this letter. But that proved to God that Abraham trusted and obeyed him. And we shall see later in chapter 5, uh, sorry, chapter 4, why Abraham was willing to go through with that. There was a reason. And the reason lay in Abraham's faith. And the reason for that faith lay in God's dealings <laughs> earlier with him. To, give, to tell you the secret now before we get there, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac because he already believed God could raise the dead. And because of that faith in a resurrection from the dead, that Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac. And you're told this in Hebrews 11. If you wondered how on earth could Abraham bring himself to kill his own son as a sacrifice, the answer is he had the faith to believe that God would raise him from the dead afterwards. That's an amazing faith for a man 4,000 years ago and 2,000 years before Jesus died and rose again, that he had such a faith. He's the first man who believed that God could raise the dead. I'm sorry I'm making a big mistake of rushing ahead in my notes, but we'll come to that in the next chapter. But can you see all this fits together? The one condition that God requires on our side to declare us innocent is faith in him of the sort that Abraham had. And faith is a mixture of trust and obedience, or obeying because you trust. And therefore, you, when you trust someone, you do what they tell you. When you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, take these pills. You put your trust in the doctor, not when you are given the pills, but when you take them. And you're saying, I trust the doctor knows what I need. So I do what he tells me. If you go to the doctor and you don't do what he tells you, you really have no faith, no trust. And so this word faith comes eight times in these few verses and 16 times in the whole passage we are talking about this morning. It's the key word in chapters three, four, and five. And it's the key word in salvation. But it's not saying you believe that. It's believing in the one who paid for your sins which means you trust him and do what he tells you. So that's more than just saying the sinner's prayer. It's, it's something much deeper. It's doing something that shows you trust the Lord and will do what he tells you. Hope I've made that clear. So let's just run through these key verses, 21 to 26, are a key passage in the whole of Romans. And they go to the very heart of the gospel. And the heart of the gospel is the cross, the fact that your sins have now been paid for. Up to now, God forbore with sin, forbearance, which means overlooking sin, accepting that you're a sinner, but not declaring you innocent. But now, sin has been paid for. Because, as the, he repeats here, because all have sinned and come short, and therefore no one can save themselves, that's like trying to lift yourself by pulling on your bootlaces. You can't do it. You can never make yourself innocent. And one of the tragedies of sin is that you lose your innocence and you can never give it back to yourself again. 
to illustrate that from the sexual sphere. As soon as you have had sexual intercourse with someone you were not married to, then you have lost your innocence and you can't give it back to yourself again. And you know it in you. You've lost something. That's why God told us to save sex for marriage. You want to come to marriage innocent so that you can give the one you're marrying the best wedding present you could give. And that's your innocence. And the beauty of that is that you will forever afterwards associate that pleasure with the one to whom you're married. That's God's plan that we come to marriage, both of us, innocent. And therefore we will never mentally associate sexual pleasure with anyone else. And that will hold you together for the rest of your life. Because you experience that pleasure for the first time with the one that you're married to for the rest of your life. That's God's intention and you can see that Young people are losing their innocence and will never be able to come to marriage without the memory of that first intercourse, which is tragic. And they will then be subject to Satan's temptation of thinking of that other person while they're having sex with their wife. You can understand God's rules of absolute chastity before marriage and absolute fidelity after marriage. They make for the happiest marriage. It's so sensible. When I talk to young people, I beg them, don't lose your innocence. Keep it as a wedding gift for your partner. And forever afterwards, that exquisite pleasure, and it is a pleasure, will be associated with that person and not with anyone else. And that will keep you together for as long as you live. But if you throw your innocence away, you will never know that. Tragically, you will have to ask God to cleanse your memory. Interesting thing is that God does cleanse your memory after your partner dies and you are then free, totally free in God's sight to marry someone else. But that only happens when your partner dies. It does not happen if your partner is still alive and you marry someone else. I'm getting sidetracked, I know, but I'm trying to convey something to you. Faith in Jesus is a kind of final thing that you give him your trust and obedience from then on. And on that condition, God declares you absolutely innocent. And the first man, as we shall see, who experienced that was Abraham. He was the first to whom God credited righteousness because of his faith. So the first thing is righteousness is something that God gives and we receive. It's a righteousness from God, apart from the law, apart from good deeds, apart from earning, it is entirely free. It is through faith in Jesus Christ, in him as a person who has paid the penalty for you. And by the way, this is the first mention of the Lord Jesus Christ in the letter. So far, we haven't mentioned him except right at the beginning when Paul said, I'm a slave of Jesus. But now he's mentioned as the heart of the gospel. To say that Christianity is, is Christ is a cliche, but it's a fundamental statement. Christianity, to be a Christian, is to have put your trust and therefore your obedience in this one person 
who paid the price of justice for you, which means that you've been bought with a price and that every act of forgiveness by God is written in the blood of Jesus. Forbearance up till then, forgiveness after then. So it is grace given because all have fallen short of the glory of God, and we've explained that earlier. Whether you've fallen short by 30%, 60%, 90%, or even 99%, you've fallen short, and therefore you need the free gift of grace. And that's what you receive when you believe in Jesus. And he talks about Jesus' redemption. That word redeem always means to pay for someone's freedom, to ransom them. But if you redeem something that you took to the pawnbroker, you've got to pay to get it back again. And that's called redeeming what you gave to the pawnbroker and raised some money on. Do you have pawnbrokers in Singapore? I don't, I don't know. They must be pretty well off if you do. But uh, you give something to a pawnbroker. He gives you money for it. You can spend that money or pay debts with it. But you will not redeem your property. It's yours, but it doesn't belong to you. You can't use it. It's still yours, it's in your name. But you will redeem it when you pay the price to get it back. And that's what's happened and that's why we talk about the redemption. It means more than rescuing. It means paying the price to rescue. And Jesus redeems us by paying the price with his own life, with his own blood. Forgiveness is not cheap. It always costs someone heavily and it costs Jesus everything. But the redemption is offered to us as a free gift. He paid, it's free for us. That's grace. And thirdly and lastly in this section, God is now able to be just and justifier of sinners. He is just because he made someone pay. But he gave his own son to do the paying. So never think that Jesus was rescuing us from a God reluctant to forgive. It was God who thought it up. And it was God who sent his son. And at one stage must have said, son, are you willing to go and pay? for the sins of the whole world. Raises one question, that for the slightest sin, death is the penalty, which always seems a bit uh, fierce, a bit over the top, that God should, for just one little lie, uh, pronounce death as a sentence. But there's a reason for that. By the way, I'm going back to the end of chapter one, where it says, don't you know that death is the penalty for the slightest sin? And the reason is really very simple. If God did not punish sin with death, even the slightest sin, it would mean that he was making evil eternal that he was colluding with us in spoiling his universe forever. Death must be the sentence to sin to stop it becoming eternal. Do you follow me in that? And that's why for the slightest sin that I've committed, God has to impose the death sentence. In other words, he has to say, I will now set a limit to the life of that sin. That's the perfection of God, his righteousness, that he will not allow sin to go on forever. And therefore he has imposed the death sentence and Jesus has taken the death sentence. 
It had to be that death, that horrible death, that lonely death, that painful death, because that was the penalty for any sin. It all makes sense once you look at it this way, and it all fits together. Alas, one of the leading evangelical broadcasters in England has recently said the most blasphemous thing about Jesus' death. He has said publicly in England, and he calls himself an evangelical, and he's often on the television or radio, and he said, if God punished Jesus for our sins, that is a case of classical child abuse. And that statement has gone round evangelicals in England from this teacher and leader. But that's exactly what it was. And his son gladly accepted that, as Isaac had accepted his father's will to kill him. And funnily enough, it was on the top of the same mountain that Abraham offered Isaac, or nearly killed him, and saw a ram, a male lamb, with its head caught in the thorns, and God said, you can substitute for your son Isaac that lamb. All this was prefiguring in an amazing way the lamb of God with his head caught in the thorns, a crown of thorns, on that same mountain who was the substitute sacrifice for all of us. Can you see that amazing link? What an amazing picture. It's one of the things God was constantly doing, <clears throat> showing us in the Old Testament how he was going to operate in the New. I must rush on. <laughs> this excludes the law. Verses 27 to 31. All law is excluded. And keeping the law is excluded. It's either grace that forgives and declares innocent, or it's trying to keep the law. You can't mix them up. Boasting is therefore banned because not the law observed, which brings pride to you, but the law bypassed and faith exercised. And there's no pride in believing in someone else. That's no virtue. And yet it's been reckoned in your account as righteousness. Now this means that salvation has been standardized. If there is only one God, there can be only one way to that God. The word one is important here. If there is one God, there must be only one way to that God. And therefore, there is no way to God by the law now. There is only one way, and that's the way of faith in his son Jesus. And yet, Paul says, does this nullify the law? No, he says, the law is upheld. And then he just doesn't explain that at this point. He will explain it later in Romans and we shall get the explanation. But in some amazing way, though the law is canceled as a way to God, it hasn't been nullified because this is God's way to having his law kept. And we shall find later in the epistle that love is the fulfilling of the law. And that if you love your neighbor, you don't steal from them, you don't murder them, you don't bear false witness against them. There is a, another way of fulfilling the law now. And the way of faith in Jesus He's going to get the law done without you realizing it. It's quite an amazing thing. God didn't cancel the law. 
he's found a better way of helping people to keep it, wanting to keep it. He's going to write the law, not on tablets of stone, but in their hearts, where it, they will be motivated to do what the law required. But that's all in the future. We'll come to it later. And he will say later that the law is good, holy, righteous. It's not a bad thing, the law of God. But when you use it as a way to God, it becomes a barrier. <clears throat> now we turn to chapter 4. <clears throat> Excuse me. Abraham is the father of faith. Bear in mind he's writing to the Gentile believers of Rome and the word faith comes 15 times in this chapter and the word credited comes in 10 times. So we found the key words. Faith is credited in God's accounts instead of righteousness, as righteousness. That means that to get into God's good books, all you need is faith. And if you are trusting in his son who paid the debt for you, then you are credited as a righteous man. It's an accounting term. It's a term for adding up accounts. And there's a credit and a debit side. The debit side has now vanished because the debt has been paid, justice has been satisfied. But on the credit side is your faith. And that's all God requires to declare you innocent. Case dismissed. Your judgment has taken place and you are free, an innocent person. That's again the heart of the gospel. Faith has been credited in the account in heaven of your life and it's on the positive good side and it's all you need to be declared innocent by God. What a gospel we have. What good news that is to people who are up to their eyes in debt to be told the debt is cancelled. The way they cancelled debts in the Bible days was to take the bill, the invoice, and to fold it over and nail it to the wall. So if you owed money to a grocer or a carpenter, your debt to him would be pinned upon the wall of his shop. And when that debt is cancelled, he would fold the paper over and drive the nail through both sides of the paper it's cancelled, it's gone. And that's exactly what Paul later says in another letter where he says that Jesus took your debt and he nailed it to the cross and the debt is gone. And if you really realise that, the relief that comes when the debts are paid for is sheer joy. Someone will explode with joy if you cancel their debt for them. And once again at the cross, your debt has been canceled, folded over and nailed to the cross, says Paul. Well, now this idea of faith credited, Abraham discovered that, and he was the first to do so, that therefore he was not being said to be righteous because of good deeds that he'd done. If it had been that way, he would get wages for it. God would have been under obligation to pay him. He would have got God in his debt. And you'd be amazed how many ordinary people think they can get God in their debt and that they've done enough good deeds to get him in their debt and that he's obligated to take them to heaven. He's obliged to. He's under contract to. What a dreadful thought. So it's not wages for works or 
Abraham could have boasted. It was not an obligation. It was a free will offering to Abraham. He didn't have to earn it in any way or deserve it. It was freely offered. So it was not wages for works, but a gift for faith. And then King David took up the same thought and in the psalm said, and it's for anyone. This blessing of having your debts paid off is for any man. And he, in the psalm said, blessed is the man whose sins are not accounted and not put on the debit side of the heavenly account. A lovely thought. And because of this, because Abraham discovered this before he was circumcised and before he circumcised anyone else, it means that circumcision has nothing to do with being credited as righteous in God's sight. And that's one in the eye for Jews or one in the ear for them in this letter. And with the faith that was credited to Abraham, along with it went a future that was promised to him. And the rest of the chapter five is about that promise. And Abraham believed the promises of God. That again is part of trusting someone and therefore obeying them that you're relying on something they've promised to you and you're taking them at their word and you're trusting them to keep it. All business is built on trust and once trust goes, business becomes impossible. Every business transaction, you are putting trust in someone else. You're trusting that what they've promised to do for you or what they've promised to give you they will keep. Alas, in human business, there are many disappointments and businesses go bankrupt and their debts are not paid. But normal business would be impossible without trust in the other person's word. Sadly, in London, which used to be the case that a man's word was his promise and you could trust him, that is no longer a proverb in the financial centre of London. You can't trust everybody today. And it's done a lot of harm to British business. That a man's word is not his bond anymore. And can be proved to be untrustworthy. So business in London is more on a knife edge now. But it used to be solidly based on a simple fact that if a, if a man gave his word to you, you could trust that. And that built up the riches of London. But you see, it's the same with God. You take God at his word and you trust him to keep a promise. That's what Abraham did. And he proved it again and again. And because of that, he was promised a future. When Abraham trusted God's word, he saw miracles happen. And God made promises to Abraham, which Abraham never saw fulfilled. He died before they were fulfilled. He was promised the same amount of children as there are stars in the sky. That's 6,000. In Abraham's day, the naked human eye could only see 6,000. We now know there are millions up there. But he did also promise him that his children would be as the sand of the sea. And Abraham did know that the sand on the seashore is billions. And he was promised billions of children. Today, that promise is being fulfilled. There are a billion and a half professing Christians in our world. 
And because they share Abraham's faith, or at least they profess to, they're his children. And Abraham died. Do you know how many sons he had when he died? He had nine. It's there in Genesis. You knew he had Isaac. You knew he had Ishmael first, an illegitimate son by his wife's maid servant. That was never God's will. But he couldn't wait patiently for God's promise. But when God made a promise to Abraham, Abraham was way past childbearing. So was Sarah. And she'd been barren all her life. And they were in their 90s. And God promised Abraham, you will have a son. And Abraham believed it. And then his faith faltered. And his wife's suggestion, you better have sex with my maid and that's the only way you'll get a son. And look at the result of that in the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac today. There is no love lost. That one act of Abraham has caused untold tension in our modern world. Because Ishmael has had many sons and so has Isaac. And the hatred almost between the Arab Muslims and the Jews in Israel is all due to that. It goes right back to Abraham's attempt to speed God up and listening to his wife's logic. But he got back to faith. He regretted it. And he got back to faith and he and his wife got older and older and then Isaac was born. Now that was proof to Abraham that God could raise the dead. Because, as we're told in chapter 5 here, Sarah's womb was as good as dead. And Abraham's sexuality was as good as dead at that age. And yet God brought life from two sexually dead people. It was that that gave Abraham belief in the resurrection of the dead. And for us, we have a fundamental faith in the God who brings life from death. For us, it's not Sarah's womb that proves that, but Jesus' tomb proves it. But it's the same faith. It's the same total trust in a God who can raise the dead. And it was that faith that led Abraham to sacrifice Isaac or to be willing to in later life that proved to God that he really did fear God. Now I know, remember that. So that God promised Abraham a future not only to have a son, but to have so many children that nobody could count them. Like the sand on the seashore, like the stars in the sky. Now that has been fulfilled. We can see it in our day. And therefore we have faith in the God who can bring life from the dead. He did it with his son Jesus, after he paid the penalty, it was God who raised Jesus. Jesus didn't raise himself, God raised him. It was an act of creation. God actually wiped out the old body of Jesus in the tomb and gave him a brand new body outside the tomb. We don't always realize that resurrection is not resuscitation. God didn't restore the old body of Jesus in the tomb. He didn't bring the old body to life or that body would have died again later of old age. But the body that Jesus came out of the tomb with was not the body he went into the tomb with. That body completely disappeared, leaving the grave clothes wound up. 
That was the beginning of our faith that God can make a new creation and that the old creation will pass away. That's a gigantic thing to believe that this world will disappear one day and God will make a new planet Earth and a new space. That's incredible. We're the only people in the world who believe that. That the God who created this old universe is going to make it vanish and in its place build a brand new one. Do you believe that? This is the end of your Bible. It's a promise of the future. And Abraham again is the classic case of a man who believed that what God promises to do, he will do. Even if you never see it in your lifetime, he will do it. And one of the verses that always moves me is in the middle of Hebrews 11, where after describing all the faith that all the people of God had in the Old Testament, it says, these all died still believing. And most of them never saw what God had promised them. But they died trusting in it and were told that they will come back to life in the resurrection with us. And then we'll see all those promises fulfilled. So that's faith. It's believing that God will do what he said he will do. Even if you don't live to see it, you die like Abraham, still believing in what God promised. And God had promised him descendants, a land and a city that he could live in forever. And because of that new city that God had promised, he was content to live in a tent after he retired. And as a businessman in Ur of the Colleys, he'd lived in a two-story brick house with modern fireplaces. They've discovered those houses. And they're amazing. They were Modern, they were centrally heated, they had brick walls, they had two stories. Those were the houses that Abraham lived in. I showed a photograph of one that's been unearthed in Ur of the Colleys to my wife. And it was a, a room with a, one of the fireplaces. And she looked at it and I said, what do you think of that house? Would you like to live there? And she said, it's a bit old fashioned, isn't it? <laughs> and that was a comment. I said, yes, it's 4,000 years old. <laughs> and Abraham left a comfortable brick house when he was an old man and said, I'm willing to live in a tent because God has promised me a city one day. And he died still in that tent. And he never lived to see it, but he died believing that God would do it. And so here we have a future promise of the whole world. God promised Abraham, the whole world will be yours. Not just part of the promised land in it, but the whole world. Nations, kings will be born from you. Huge promises. Only God could have kept them. And Abraham died without seeing them. But he was still believing when he died. God will do it. And I'm nearer death than many of you, statistically, though I may not be the first person in this room to die. You, you don't know. <laughs> but um, I'm nearer it at 84, I expect. It won't be long. And I may die before seeing God's promises fulfilled. But I know he'll fulfill them. Amen. I believe in a new heaven yes. and a new earth yes. and a new body for me to live in it. Yes. And I may die before I see all those things, but I know they'll happen and I know I'll be there because I believe I will have a new resurrected body. Jesus promised it. That's good enough for me. It should be good enough for every Christian. What promises we've received. But Abraham was outstanding in his faith. 
He believed everything God told him he would do. And he stuck by it. And he died believing, not seeing. But he died believing that he would inherit the whole world. That's amazing. I so look forward to meeting Abraham, don't you? A man of faith. And that's the most important thing about Abraham that you'll ever read. He believed and it, for the, his faith was credited to him for righteousness. And he was the first man to hear the verdict. He's innocent. He's justified. Remember that translation in the Pigeon English Bible? God is a immoral right. And the first man God ever said that about was Abraham. And if we share his faith, then we share his inheritance. We become sons of Abraham and therefore his heirs. That's a word that's now going to come into this letter. We are not only sons of God by faith, we are heirs of the world. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You may die without inheriting anything, but you can die believing that you're going to inherit the earth. That's your legacy that God has left you. And one day he will keep that promise. He doesn't promise to do it in your lifetime, but he's promised to do it. And therefore, faith grasps what is not seen and makes it real. It's the evidence of things hoped for. And hope for the Christian is not a wishy-washy word. It's a very strong word. It means I'm certain of the future. I'm absolutely sure that God will do what he's promised. He's going to bring his son back to earth. He's promised to do that. I'm absolutely sure of that. He's promised to create a new heaven and a new earth. And he's promised that I can live in it. And he'll keep that promise. Even though I die still believing. So the future was promised to the father of faith. Faith was credited, and therefore the future was promised. They will not be heirs of Abraham through law, but through grace. It will be an offering through faith, which will be inherited. Now, as I've said, Abraham believed in reproduction. We believe in resurrection. But they're the same thing. They're God bringing life from the dead. Happened in his own sexual life and it will happen in our own physical life too. So we move on to the fruit of faith. The results of faith. What will all this mean in practice now? Will it make any difference to life now? Or will we just have to wait for all the promises of God to fulfill? Well, the good news is we have both a new future and a new nature. And we can experience those already. So look at the key words in chapter 5, verses 1 to 21 now. The fruit of faith. And look what we've got. We already have peace with God. Now. Don't need to wait for that. Peace, it's a lovely word. Shalom. In Arabic, salam. Shalom. Beautiful word. It means harmony with yourself. Harmony with other people. Harmony with nature. And above all, harmony with God. And we've got it now. 
you can have it now. It's the present result of faith. And not only do we have peace with God, we have access to God. And we've got that now. Long before we inherit the earth, we've got access to God. Now, every king in the ancient world and in much of the modern world, particularly in Arabic countries, a king is someone you can approach. If you are a citizen of the kingdom, you have a right to come into the king's private throne chamber and present your petition. And you must have seen pictures of Arabs particularly queuing up in a king's room with petitions which they can present to him. They have access. And it's one of the unusual features of Arabic culture that every citizen has access to the king. But as Christians, we've got access to the king of kings. You can go to the king of kings at any time and in any place with a petition and ask him for help. That's a privilege in the now, not something you have to wait for or may still be believing will happen when you die. It's something you can enjoy every day. We have access to the throne of grace. Little girl was going home from Sunday school and she was singing a chorus she had just learned or a chorus she thought she'd learned and she ran down the street singing, God is still on the phone, God is still on the phone. But she'd got it right. You don't need a mobile phone to get through to God. You can get through to God now in an instant. Wherever you are, whatever's happening, you have access to the throne of grace. What a sheer privilege. Non-Christians don't have that access. They may, they may pray. They may say their prayers. But they don't have access. And the Holy of Holies is now wide open. The curtain that shut off the Holy of Holies from the ordinary people, even from the ordinary priests, has been ripped in two from top to bottom when Jesus died. And we now have total access into the Holy of Holies of heaven for the earthly tabernacle and the earthly temple were only copies of what is really happening up there in heaven. And we have access. I just can't get over this. What a privilege. Why don't we use it more? We've got access and peace. And I've only given you the first sentence of chapter five. And if I carry on at this rate, we'll never get to the end of the chapter, so I must. So let me move on. One of the things we already have is hope. Now, it's interesting that Romans begins with an emphasis on faith. And now we move into an emphasis on hope and later we shall move into an emphasis on love. It's the trinity of the Christian life. Now abideth faith, hope, and love. And I would conclude, now abides faith, hope, and love, but of, the, of these, the most neglected is hope. And we live in a world that people are without God and therefore without hope. They're not without wishful thinking, but the use of the word hope in English anyway is a very uncertain word. We hope it'll be fine tomorrow. Well, if you live in England, we're always talking about the weather and we're always disappointed with it. We hope it's gonna be fine and then it rains. It's so unpredictable. We hope to avoid cancer. We hope for a better job. We hope, but these earthly hopes are not sure at all. The word hope 
in the Bible, elpis, the Greek word, means to be absolutely certain. And we have been given a hope to live by now. We have this certainty of the future to live by. It's not a wishful thinking. It's not hoping we'll have a good holiday. It's not even hoping for heaven in that sense, that maybe we might get there after we die. Christian hope is an anchor to the soul, says the letter to the Hebrews. And an anchor is something that goes down to the bottom of the sea and hooks onto something and holds the ship steady. And Christian hope is an anchor to hold you steady when you're going through bad times, when you're going through storms, when the wind is battering you and threatening to drift you onto the rocks. In circumstances like that, you have an anchor that holds firm a hope for the future that will not be destroyed by anything that happens to you. And having talked to saints either under persecution or suffering terribly from fatal disease and having talked to them, I know I've seen those who have a certain hope of the future can see it through. They've got an anchor deep down that holds the ship in the same place, whatever forces are battering above. Hope is a wonderful thing to live by and you can live by it when it's sure, when it's certain. You may not see it yet, but when you know it's coming, it makes a whole difference to how you live. When you are sure that Jesus is coming back, that makes a difference to how you live life today and will have a profound effect on what you can face. And he actually goes on to say that you can rejoice in suffering, knowing that suffering will only produce more hope. It has a way of working like this, that suffering will produce patience and patience will produce character and character will produce hope so that you can rejoice in bad times when you're really going through it and feel under it. Your hope will be made stronger by it. And I've seen that happen, but only in Christians who are sure of the future and their hope comes out brighter and stronger and better after they've really been through it. We have peace with God. We have access to him. We have hope that we can live by, that we will anchor us to the rock below. What else have we got? We've got love shed abroad in our hearts. Here's the amazing thing. And for the first time, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. And it's through the Holy Spirit that God's love is shed abroad in your heart. And you find yourself with love for the most surprising people. People you never loved before. People you don't like. And the love of God is shed abroad in your heart through the Holy Spirit. What benefits there are from faith. And it's all come out of faith in Jesus. And we're listing the benefits. Not only is there inspiring hope, a hope of glory, and that's the third part of salvation. Justification is the first part, sanctification is the second, and glorification is the third. The hope of glory. We're going to shine with glory such as Jesus had when he was transfigured on the mountain in front of Peter, James, and John. That's glory. It's shining its splendor. Who was that pop artist? I'm trying to think. Can you remind me? A pop singer called himself 
Oh dear. He's been in trouble recently in old age for... Garrett Litter. Can any of you remember Garrett Litter? What a name for a pop star. And he wore all sequined costumes. Garrett Litter. He shone with sequins. He's an old man now and he's anything but shining. But nevertheless, I once said when I was preaching on Daniel, where Daniel says the righteous will shine like stars. I said, Gary Litter won't get a look in. When you're glorified, you'll shine like a star and it won't ever get old and fade. Well, now, a recording of that sermon went to the United Nations headquarters in Paris near the Eiffel Tower. And in the United Nations headquarters, there was a New Zealander who was a member of our church before that, but when he went to the United Nations headquarters in Paris, he started a Bible study group in the United Nations headquarters there. And uh, he got about a dozen people along. And he played a recording of one of my sermons each week to this little group. Not the only group to do that. But he played that recording of Daniel where I said, you will shine like stars. Gary Glitter will fade, but you'll shine like stars. I was trying to be clever, trying to be appropriate or trying to be relevant. And I just mentioned it. Sitting in the little circle of a dozen people in Paris was Gary Glitter's mistress. And she wasn't listening to my recording. She wasn't interested till she heard Gary Glitter. And boy, then she got interested and her ears pricked up and by the end of that talk, she belonged to Christ. <laughs> you never know, a little stray word can be used by God in the most unexpected way. It's our hope of glory. Does that excite you? Yes, yes. Does it thrill you, the hope of glory? Yes. And it's a hope in suffering, because that will produce more hope for you. And it's a hope in love that has been shed abroad in your hearts. Who says there are no benefits now to a life of faith? All this is yours in this world and in this life. And there will be increasing help for you from Jesus himself. And here comes an argument about future salvation. Paul says, if we have been justified by his blood, how much more will we be saved? Notice the will be future salvation. How much more will we be saved by his life? And the tragedy of focusing on the death of Christ all the time is that you miss out on the how much more will we be saved by his life. The resurrection means more to us than his death. His death was wonderful. It enabled us to be justified and declared innocent. But how much more will we be saved by the risen, ascended Christ, now at the right hand of the Father, taking our prayers and presenting them to the Father on our behalf. I wrote a little booklet, it's maybe on the bookstall, I don't know, called, Where is Jesus Now and What is He Doing? And it's really saying, don't believe that Jesus is still on earth and somewhere in your heart, a little Jesus. He's up there, He's at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit has taken His place on earth. That's why you don't receive Jesus now, you receive the Holy Spirit, who is his deputy on earth. But we have Jesus now on high at the right hand of the Father, presenting our cause, an advocate. If a Christian sins, 
We have an accuser in heaven, Satan, who says, there you go, there's one of your children sinning. God calls himself a Christian, calls himself a godly man, and look at him. Whenever we sin, there is an accuser in heaven, and that's where the devil is. He has access to the heavenly places until he's thrown down to earth at a stage in future history. We have an accuser up there, but as John says in his letter, at the same time we have an advocate up there to plead our cause. That's one of the things Jesus is doing for you right now. He's interceding for you now praying for you when nobody else is praying for you. No. I'm just amazed at chapter 5. I've got all this now. And what there is yet to come, the mind just boggles. So we have increasing help from him who died, not for his friends, not for good people, but who died for his enemies. Greater love has no man than this, said Jesus, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's quoted so often, remembering the dead in two world wars. It's on their monuments. Greater love hath no man than this. But did you ever hear of a British man who died for the Germans during World War II? I never did. I heard of many who died for their colleagues and their country and for a good cause, a good cause. But I've only ever heard of one person who died for his enemies, and that's Jesus. What love he must have had to die for those who rebelled, who hated him. And that love is shed abroad in your heart. So it was his death for his enemies and now his life for his friends. Don't forget that last bit. It's not just his death that saves you, it's his life. How much more will you be saved by his life? And it doesn't refer to his life before he died, but his life after he rose. His present life, how much more will you be saved now and in the future? by his life. When he comes again, do you know why he's coming again? According to Hebrews 9, he's coming to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. I'm looking forward to being saved. Salvation is future. Out of past, present and future tenses of the verb saved, you have been saved, you are being saved, you will be saved. The emphasis of the New Testament is on the future. There is more about your future salvation than your past. And I react negatively when someone uses for me in conversation the past tense of saved. They tell me, we had 10 people saved last Sunday. Or I was saved 20 years ago at a Billy Graham crusade. Every evangelical I talk to only uses the word saved in the past tense as if it's all over and all finished. It's not, it's only just begun. And uh, I've had that reaction even since I came to Singapore. Somebody used a word saved to me and I said, you mean they began to be saved? They looked a bit surprised when I said that. I began to be saved when I was 17, but it was only the beginning of my salvation. I will be saved. I look forward to being saved. When Jesus comes back, that will be when I will be saved, fully saved, completely saved. My body is not saved yet. It still bears the marks of my past life. But the redemption of my body is coming when Jesus gets back. And my body will be saved. This one's going to rot in a tomb. 
I'm not going to be cremated, I want to be buried. And I've chosen the spot. <laughs> because when you bury someone, it looks as if you're planting them in the earth. And what you plant in the earth will spring forth. I'm not against cremation, but Christians have always preferred burial like the Lord and look forward to coming out of the grave. Now, don't get me wrong. God can raise up a new body from ashes as well as dust. <laughs> He's the creator, and he will do it. So he doesn't say, if you get cremated, I'm not going to raise you. Don't believe that. <laughs> and don't you dare say David Pawson said that. But I, pref I prefer burial. And it's interesting that cremation has had more serious psychological effect in terms of ongoing grief than burial ever does. Because it's somehow to some people, maybe neurotic, but they believe they've destroyed their loved one. Whereas if you plant them in the earth, you haven't destroyed the body, you've planted it. So it's a little easier to believe in resurrection when you've been buried. But I just throw that out in case you're still wondering which you want. <laughs> now then we come to a most extraordinary section, verses 12 to 21. And here there's a very simple truth which many find very difficult to accept. And the truth is that through one man's single act of disobedience, death has come to the entire human race. And through one man's act of obedience has come justification for the human race. And the one man who is disobedient, we remember, is Adam. And here is a very important principle. If you find it difficult to accept that one man, Adam, brought death to everybody else, you will find it just as difficult to believe that one man's obedience has brought life to a new human race. But the two go together. We have become so individualistic in our thinking in the 20th century that we think that each man is an island living to himself and that how can I be blamed for what Adam did? There's a pride in us that wants to be responsible for ourselves and say, I did it my way. That's the national anthem of sinners. Uh, Allah, who, who was the singer who first sang it? American singer. Not Bing Crosby, the other one. Frank Sinatra, thank you. And that song, that when you reach the end of the road in life, you want to be able to say, I did it my way. Well, I baptized Cliff Richard and I went with him to Berlin to a big meeting where he sang a version of that song called I Did It His Way. <laughs> and he gave a wonderful testimony and song that when he w reached the end of the road, he wanted to be able to say I did it his way. It was a wonderful song and tragically he only ever sang it once because the copyright owners for I Did It My Way objected to his using the tune and most of the words. <laughs> so I only heard it the once, but it summed up his testimony. I knew him well and he's a hum humble Christian. And uh, that was his desire at that time. I did it his way. But we are corporate beings. You were inside Adam when he did that. You were in his DNA. You were literally in his body. You are descended from him. 
You get your DNA from him. And therefore, his one act of disobedience brought death to reign over the entire human race. And human nature says, that's not fair, Lord. But then you can also say of Christ dying for your sins, that's not fair, Lord. There is such a thing as corporate humanity. And in one man, Adam, we fell. And the result was sin and death. That means quite simply that death is not natural to human beings. Science cannot prove why we have to die. At some point our bodies stop replacing cells that are dying with new cells and we begin to wind down. And no scientist can tell you why that happens. They can tell you how it happens but they cannot tell you why. And I challenge a scientist to tell me why does that process of whereby the capacity of our body to renew itself begins to fade and your teeth get fewer and your hair gets thinner. Your body is winding down. Somebody said every heartbeat is a drumbeat on the road to the grave. And I can predict that unless Christ comes back first, everybody in this room is going to die, including a speaker and including everyone who can hear his voice. The two certainties of life are death and taxes. <laughs> and there will always be both and we shall all die. And that's because of what Adam did. If you accept that that is the case, then you can understand that because of what one man, Jesus, did, the whole human race was involved. As in Adam all die, and we are all born in Adam, we all were in Adam, we are all descended from his genes, as in Adam all die, so all in Christ will be made alive. And that's made possible by this corporate nature of humanity. That is why Paul's ambition was to see one new man in Christ Jesus. Not a lot of people in Christ Jesus, but one new humanity, one new race. When I became a Christian, I ceased to be Homo sapiens and I became Homo novus, which means new man, one new man. In Christ, we have become one new humanity. As the old humanity, death reigned over it and still does. And over the finest brain and the finest body, and the finest life, death hangs. And we leave everything behind. It was asked of one of the richest men in the world, how much did he leave? And the laconic reply was, everything. And the tragedy is that the greatest brains rot in the grave. And that's not a natural thing. We rebel against it, it doesn't seem right that it should happen. We hate it, we put it off, we postpone it because death is the last enemy that we face. My body is still Homo sapiens, but I am Homo novus. I'm the new man in Christ. It's a new humanity in which we belong to each other corporately. We're not just individuals. And we'll see that expanded later in the epistle. But I've said enough. One last comment. Homework. <laughs> Read chapters 6 to um, 11 before tomorrow, please. You will get more out of the epistle if you've read it before I talk about it. 
Thank you for listening.